Thank you all very much for being here, and uh, thank you to our panel for joining us uh, this morning. We have a distinguished panel with many different perspectives from the startup community in Japan, uh, from the venture capital community, and from big tech, shall we call it big tech with Microsoft, and thank you for coming to us from, uh, from Redmond, Washington. Um, is a fascinating uh, panel that, that we just uh, got finished with, too. Um, I wanted to shift a little bit to focus on uh, technology and the technology situation right now. We were talking at a time of seismic change uh, in the technology industry. Uh, in the early years of the industry, uh, it was viewed really as a unquestioned force for good. We were allowing people and companies to do things that they could never do before. That perspective has changed quite a bit in recent years. We now have Facebook, for example, under fire for screwing up the 2016 election, questions about privacy, we have a trade war going on also. So as, as you look into 2020, I'd like to ask each of you, what is one thing that you're most excited about in the industry, and what is one thing that you're most concerned about? And Miko, if we could start with you. OK, so probably I'll give you a quick introduction of myself. So I am the founder and CEO of Cinnamon, uh, which is a business AI company uh, to support office workers. Especially we provide our AI to understand unstructured data to finance industry and uh, manufacturers. So I'm from AI industry. So probably I can give you that perspective. So the most exciting thing is that Japan is actually the most advanced uh, country in terms of business AI. Uh, for other AI categories like internet AI and uh, perception AI and autonomous AI, uh, Japan is a lot behind to uh, the US and China. But in terms of business AI, we are a lot ahead. Uh, I feel, I'm feeling one, year, one and a half years ahead to the US and a lot ahead to China. So already in Japan, uh, enterprise use uh, business AI even today, but actually in the US, this is still POC phase. So it is the Japan can be a leading country. So I'm excited about I'm excited about that the most. Do you want to talk about what you're most concerned about <laughs> in the year ahead? <laughs> Yeah, so my, uh, my concern is, yeah, so for other categories, Japan is a lot behind. And we do not have that many AI talent and also computer science uh, students, computer science major uh, students. So we do not have enough resources to make it advanced. So that is the most uh, concern. Yeah. James? Um, so I'll start with most, most exciting. Um, so first of all, uh, I guess since we're doing a bit of self-introductions, so uh, you know, I run uh, Coral Capital. Uh, we're one of the top seed stage venture capital firms in Japan. Um, and so we are, we're investing in the very, very early stages uh, when there's maybe three people in the company, they're just hacking away, uh, you know, trying to change the world. And for, in terms of what we're excited about, um, so I started a company in Japan uh, about six or seven years ago. Um, and I started my career at J.P. Morgan, and when I left uh, J.P. Morgan, by the way, I was in the Tokyo office, a lot of my uh, colleagues and uh, you know, the people I joined the company with me, who were mostly Japanese, uh, were very concerned when I said that I was going to leave my company. Um, and you know, in Japan, the traditional path is to go to large corporates, and I was basically throwing that away after a year and a half of working there. And so... But you know what's happened over the next like six or seven years is that the sentiment uh, in the sort of perspective on, of entrepreneurship has changed quite a bit. And so what it, what's ended up happening now is I've actually invested in some of my you know J.P. Morgan colleagues um, and a lot of them that had never really thought about uh, pursuing a career in entrepreneurship have chosen that path, uh, whether that is to start companies on their own or to actually join startups themselves. Um, and so one thing I want to emphasize is that uh, I think in a lot of cases, the uh, English media tends to reinforce this image that Japan is a very risk-averse country. And that's still true to a certain extent. But if you really sort of look under the hood of what's happening in the startup ecosystem, that's no longer necessarily the case. And so what's happened is that you've had really, really top caliber talent like Miku-san here that have, uh, you know, if they wanted to work into work in a traditional company and, and rise up the ranks, it'd be very easy for them. 
but they've thrown that career away to uh, start something from zero or at least join a group of uh, visionaries that are trying to do something for Japan. And so uh, what, what that means for Japan is that there are lots of very, very big industries like insurance, healthcare, logistics, et cetera, where it's very hard for sort of the traditional dorm room startup to pursue. Uh, but if you are thinking, if you are someone that has worked in that industry, you know, maybe you're a doctor, or maybe you're a lawyer, or maybe you worked in, uh, you know, at one of the trading companies in Japan, uh, you have, un you, you've worked there enough to understand the pain points, but you're not necessarily, you haven't been there your entire career to sort of be programmed to think that that's the way that it should be. And so there are a lot of people that come out of these companies that are um, frustrated with the way that things are being done and know that technology is a way to sort of completely revolutionize those industries. Um, and so we've been fortunate that we've invested in a lot of those guys that are pursuing these very, very big markets and trying to use technology to uh, completely change the way things are done there. Now, pessimistic. <laughs> um, so... Okay, so there's, a, there's also a sentiment in Japan that uh, after the Olympics, um, things are not going to be so great. And so we've seen this, this tremendous growth. But I think uh, psychologically, things are anchored toward this goal of uh, you know, the Olympics and everything's going to be great until the Olympics. Um, and especially in the startup world, um, there's a sentiment that uh, that's changing. And uh, I worry that that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because it really makes no sense, right? It doesn't make sense that the economy is good because of the Olympics, right? That's, it's, but people are uh, anchored to that, that uh, event, and I'm worried that all this progress that we've made uh, is going to take a hit uh, after the Olympics. And Lila, you have a bit of a different perspective with the global company. Yeah, I think I have my perspective is a little bit more global, but I think it affects every country in the world. Um, you know, I often talk to students and colleges that are graduating, and uh, I love to say that we live in time and place like no other. It's like Renaissance, um, an entirely new uh, ways and, and streams of uh, capabilities are going to be open. Um, if you think about, you know, the, the Gutenberg Press, Right before the press arrived, uh, we were or we were only publishing, uh, you know, thousands of books a year. After that, it was hundreds of thousands. Uh, we started things like novel. <laughs> you know, we started sharing information in a way that it was never shared before. We're in a similar place and time now, where things that we never thought would be possible are possible today. And what is really interesting is that now that we've built kind of the fundamental capabilities of AI, um, this. Opportunities are now open to all companies. It doesn't matter if, if your company is in uh, automotive or energy or medicine. Now you have the fundamental building blocks of artificial intelligence and knowledge to start completely revolutionizing your field. And uh, this is not about to stop. We're at the very dawn of these abilities. So it's an incredibly exciting time. And it's incredibly exciting time for Japan because Japan has incredible industries that are already built, and it's an opportunity to take them to a whole new level. Olympics or not, I think this is not about to stop. It is now, the flip side of that, it is our responsibility to take care of this innovation in a responsible way. What does that mean? With any power comes great responsibility. When we see changes like this, so let's consider the beginning of the last century. We were at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. You know, we had, you know, in the United States, we had Rockefellers and Carnegie's that uh, were now able to produce steel, you know, to create incredible machinery, to take economy to a whole new height. At the same time, the governments wor weren't yet ready for that a rapid change. And what happened is a lot of problems emerged. You know, we had children working in factories. We had 20-hour working days. I mean, this is crazy things like that. Well, AI can introduce similar problems. And this means that every one of us has a responsibility and accountability as innovators, as investors, as companies to ensure that we shepherd this innovation in the way that is positively affecting us as a society, as individuals, not just as companies. So those are the two sides of the same coin. It's both really exciting, but also a huge responsibility that's on our shoulders. 
Uh, thank you. I, I'm glad you brought up AI. I wanted to delve a little bit deeper into that. That's one of the most exciting technologies on the horizon. As you mentioned, it's one that's touching virtually every industry. And perhaps we could begin with you. You're involved at Microsoft with trying to um, set the guidelines for AI and for mixed reality. What are the things that, that you're thinking about in terms of guidelines for not just Microsoft, but companies beyond that? And what are the, some, of the, some of the things at Microsoft that you won't do or that companies shouldn't do when it comes to these uh, technologies? Yeah, we believe that we have responsibility to set standards for ourselves, uh, as well as to help uh, governments actually figure out what those standards should be, because we, we're the closest to what is possible today. And what is possible is really, um, you know, um, when I was a little child, my father was a, my father is a, as a professor of mathematics, and uh, he used to always tell me, Lila, we're not the crown of invention. And I used to think, well, do you mean we're not a crown of invention? We're like the, the most important species on the planet you know, in my child brain, right? But as now we are uh, evolving uh, capabilities for intelligence, it is so clear. And every day it's more and more clear how limited our brain is. So what we're effectively doing is creating um, assistance, intelligent assistance for ourselves. I, whether we do it through mixed reality, uh, assisted reality, Right, to help ourselves see across the world, hear you know, through the, across the ocean, or it is intelligence that we're building to be able to you know, see in the dark or hear when, uh, when it's really noisy, let's say, or speak a hundred languages in our own voice. Right? We are creating extension to our human capabilities. That is extremely powerful, yet it is extremely dangerous. So uh, it's not dangerous as a, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a dangerous like any tool would be, right? So if we're creating these powerful tools, what is the responsibility that we have to carry as an organization to make sure that these tools are used for positive change as opposed to uh, for the negative, right? And uh, last year, so for example, let's, uh, let's take things like recognizing faces, super powerful, right? In India uh, last year, uh, this technology was used to identify about 300 children that were lost. That, how, how impressive is that, right? But at the same time, this could be used for all kinds of other things. And this is, this is why uh, we actually, in fact, published documentation and blogs and published our own internal guidelines on how we believe this technology, what are the right ways and wrong ways to use this technology. And the way we do it is we actually embed uh, ethics and society, we call it that, that team, directly with the engineering teams. So as technology is getting built, we try to analyze and understand what are the side effects and repercussions of this technology. So for example, some of you may use Teams. Teams is a Microsoft product that uh, allows you to chat, uh, video conference, uh, store your documents uh, for your organization. So it's fairly straightforward, very useful. Uh, we're experiencing huge adoption. It has a lot of AI in it. So for example, transcription and translation within that tool uh, is you know, perceived hugely valuable. But before we decided that we would implement something like that, we actually spent more than six months identifying side effects of uh, introducing such a function. And very interestingly, we found out that there are, for example, chilling factors. So if you turn on transcription without having people opt in directly by themselves and have making that choice, they will actually speak less. And especially so if they are a minority, right? So we specifically orchestrate and engineer to avoid such outcomes. This is just one example, but this is happening all the time. We actually don't release certain products or we, uh, we turn down uh, customers if we don't believe that the use case that we are applying uh, technology to does not conform to our own ethical guidelines. That's very helpful. I, I want to ask uh, both of the other panelists' opinions on this too, but Miko, perhaps we could start with you because you think about these things all the time as you develop Cinnamon's AI products. Yeah, so lots of media is saying that AI is the AI is reading of humans' job, and media is talking about negatively. But actually, I've never 
heard about that kind of issues from company sides. So I have already talked with probably hundreds of companies, but their, their issue is more like they didn't have enough people. So Japan is decreasing our population, so we do not have enough people. So in 10 years, we, we will be in a, uh, we'll be short of 10 million people in, labor, in terms of labor. And also, uh, Abe Prime Minister is talking about uh, work style revolution. So a company is supposed to decrease the working hours. So we don't have enough people, and AI can improve about it. AI can solve it. And also, the reason that I started this business is actually uh, the born of my son two and a half years ago. So at that time, actually, we had a very sad news that a Japanese young lady committed suicide because of working too much. And probably I would thought uh, it is a sad news and it is multi to, uh to commit a suicide, but uh, probably I would forget about it before the birth of my son. And because I got a son, I started to think about the future and this next generation. So I start to think, yeah, we need to change this work style when our child starts working, like in 20 years. So that, so I think that is not my, just my personal mission, and our generation should uh, think like that. That's interesting. Yeah, the demographic implications of AI may be different in Japan than they are in other countries where job replacement is a real concern. James. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good point. So uh, that's fundamentally different about other markets is that Japan, because it's, you know, you have this sort of declining population, you have this later labor so shortage, um, there is a increasing need to get more out of the workforce. Um, and so to solve this problem in Japan, uh, there are basically like two levers that you can pull. One is automation, and that includes maybe AI. Uh, and the other one is immigration, right? And since we're on the automation topic, I can dive into that. Um, you know, we've invested in a lot of, uh, for example, SaaS companies where um, a lot of the processes in Japan, if you've been in Japan, for, you know, you, you know uh, this quite well, but there's a lot of paperwork and there's a lot of uh, inefficiencies, right? And so we've invested in the software companies that are replacing uh, you know, mundane tasks like HR paperwork or you know, con contract work. Or um, you know, I'll give you an example uh, of a company we've invested in where they're building SaaS for uh, pharmacies. And believe it or not, there are more pharmacies in Japan than there are company, convenience stores, right? And there's a convenience store in every block. Um, so it's pretty incredible. Uh, and so what was happening is that, you know, you, you go to the pharmacy, you give them your prescription, and they ask you some questions like, you know, uh, how, you know, do you smoke? Uh, how many times uh, do you drink? Do you have allergies? These kind of things. And they're, they're writing it on a paper, and then they, at the end of the day, the pharmacists go in the back, and they, you know, manually enter everything that they've written on paper, and that takes like two, three hours, right? Ridiculous. Um, and so no pharmacist wants to do this. And so this company is basically providing a tablet-based system where you just enter it in um, and then you're done. And so the pharmacist can cut out two, three hours out of every single day. So that's huge, right? Um, and another one that we've, uh, we've invested in is um, a company that's building software for uh, robots to take over tasks in commercial kitchens. So I don't know if you've been following the news, but uh, you know, Japan has, is, is amazing because of all the convenience stores that you have. Um, but convenience stores are also, in Japan, they run 24 hours. And recently, a lot of convenience stores haven't been able to stay open for 24 hours because they just don't have people to staff them, right? And so it's a, it's a huge problem. And this is top of mind not just for convenience store managers, but also for the restaurant chains. And so the company that we invested in, uh, they take over some of these very, very mundane tasks, like frying uh, um, karage, uh, fried chicken, uh, or like turning yakitori, um, you know, and all kinds of things that you see maybe in the in a company that can all be replaced by uh, a robot just doing it. And so you have you free up staff to tend to customers, and uh, there's not this sort of like underlying um, political sentiment where hey these these robots and this AI is taking over our jobs, right? And so it's very natural. So I think that progression will be uh, different in Japan and it'll be much faster in Japan. Um. Let's talk a little bit more about Japan and the startup environment in Japan. In 
in AI in particular, I think the US and China have jumped out to a pretty substantial lead in terms of innovating in some of these technology areas. Um, there's an author who wrote a book saying there, there will be no bronze medal in AI. There's going to be a gold and a silver, and there will be no third place. Um, obviously, that has implications for countries like Japan and the rest of the world. And Miku, I know you have some strong feelings about how what the opportunities are in AI beyond those two big markets. Could you talk about what you see? Yeah, so uh, for example, the, the AI that we provide to an insurance company, we are, for example, the Daiichi Insurance, which is our client, and they have 2,000 people just only for design tree work. Like uh, James said, uh, he was, uh, he was, his, uh, his, uh, his investing company is uh, solving by tablets, but uh, actually, sometimes IT, I mean, uh, tablets or those kind of IoT cannot solve the current operation. So what we are trying to do is that without changing the current operation, for example, a uh, hospital submitting a document to uh, clients or insurance, insurance companies, but still uh, inside the company, we can change the operation with AI. So uh, we are trying to, uh, to replace 1,000 people out of 2,000 people to AI and uh, our clients cannot hire enough people to maintain their business. And that is the positive side of, positive side of AI, I believe. And, and just to back up what Miku's saying, um, so I, I think most people in the audience might be familiar with robot process and automation, um, uh, RPA. So UiPath is the leader in the space for uh, this kind of work, you know, automating these sort of processes. Um, so in 2000, was it 17, uh, they had three people in their Japan office. Uh, this year, uh, there was an article saying that they had 300 people, right? And that's, that's basically 10% of UiPath's uh, workforce, um, global workforce. Um, and that just shows you, I don't know what their revenue numbers are, but I assume that Japan is, if not the biggest market for them, one of the biggest markets. Um, and that just shows you the extreme demand uh, to automate processes in these large corporates, because there's so many legacy systems and operations that uh, have been done by humans, and those humans are not going to be there in 10 years. Yeah, I have seen an interesting ranking, and it was automation potential ranking. And Japan is, was the number one <laughs> of that ranking. And I guess that ranking was almost saying uh, inefficient country ranking. Uh, it's, the, it's the third biggest market for robot process, uh, process automation right now, and I think it'll increase. Okay. Just to add to that, uh, AI will get democratized the same way as cloud computing got democratized, and it actually will create more startups the same way cloud computing created more startups because it's going to be easier to build additional AI algorithms on top of the fun fundamental building blocks. So it's just going to be make, just like we made it cheaper to build software and run it on the cloud, we're going to do this exactly the same thing with AI. Right, so I, I think the, that it's, uh, it's actually just really great for the startup ecosystem. Okay, I think we're gonna have to leave it there. Thank you all very much for your participation. Please a hand for our audience. <laughs>